ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will now start the session uh, Rakuten and Microsoft Talk DevOps in the Real World. P please welcome Mr. Kotaro Ogino, Mr. Drew Robbins, and Mr. Tsuyoshi Ushio. Hey! Hello! Hey, everyone! Do you like DevOps? <laughs> DevOps! <laughs> no! You, you, need any, uh, you need energy, right? So, DevOps! 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 Cool! Shall I start? Okay, I'm a Tsuyoshi Ushio from the Microsoft Corporation, and uh, he's, a, he's a Drew Robbins. Oh, could, you, could you introduce yourself, please? Sure, I'm Drew Robbins, and uh, I work for Microsoft Japan here. I'm a uh, technical evangelism lead. Okay. Hey, Mr. Kotaro, please yeah. introduce yourself. I'm Kotaro Ozino. I'm from Rakuten, and I'm leading a test automation team. Nice to meet you. Cool. Yeah, so today we are going to about DevOps in real world. So it is not about basic. This is about case study and uh, mindset and practices. Okay? Are you ready? Okay. Cool. So, oh, Drew, what is this? Uh, could you explain about this? Yeah, this is uh, an interesting picture. Uh, this past year, actually, we invited um, the Learning Consortium, which is uh, actually sponsored by the Scrum Alliance, to come to Microsoft. And we said, come and see about our agile practices. <laughs> and they were, they, they were really confused, because this, this is the image that they, they thought about when we invited them to come to uh, Microsoft. It's this big, big battleship that can't turn very quickly or anything. <laughs> And so, uh, but it was interesting, Tsuyoshi-san. Once they came, they got the, this, uh, this kind of image, which is a bunch of little speedboats working in coordination with each other. And they were really surprised about our, our agile transformation, this big company that can, uh, can move to uh, agile. And I love it because a lot of times when people have this impression of Microsoft and what it is, and they get a chance to come to our campus in uh, Seattle, Washington, and they get that impression usually breaks down. And so today we're going to talk more about yeah. our agile transformation. Yes. Um, and as one of the case studies, right? So yes, that's what this exactly. is. Exactly. Cool, cool. Yeah. It is represent the real world in uh, Microsoft. And so, um, of course, Microsoft is huge actually. So we have a, a lot of the products and uh, people and something like that. Look at this. Oh, ridiculous. You know, this is a, a DevOps tools, a table, and a lot of the tools in there, but uh, in only one company, Microsoft cover everything. This is only one company in the world, I think. Ridiculous, you know, not agile. <laughs> but we need to cover everything. So what should we do? <laughs> and uh, today's session is uh, based on uh, uh, my DevOps interview activity. And I'm, I'm every time I do the DevOps interview for the very clever guy and cool guy like him, <laughs> yeah, like Mr. O, oh, like him, <laughs> yeah, right. So we did a lot. I we did a lot of the interviews, and I and write an article both in Japanese and English, so all of you can read these articles. Yeah, please enjoy it. And sometimes I do the interview, for example, the Jeff Hambles and Mike Morrises and yeah, some Guggenheimers or something like that. Yep. So we're going to talk to you about today is a DevOps journey at first, then the automation, mainly him part, his part, cool. And if we have a time, we will discuss about the continuous improvement. This is the content of today. Uh, shall we start on the DevOps journey? Cool. And DevOps is a sim just simple definition. And DevOps is a Kaizen activity for software life, uh, the software life cycle and the business value by collaborating among Dev and Ops and the biz. Then this is uh, these days uh, definition. And if you want to know about more, just read this book. This is the Bible of the DevOps in the U.S. Right? This is a, s a story of the transition into the Azure. Uh, no, 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 and uh, DevOps. So. Yeah, it, it might be very interesting, written by Jim Kim. So, but, and this session is not the basic session of the DevOps, because uh, Yoshiba is already talked about, right? So, oh, what is this slide? Please explain. Sure, yeah, so 
We wanted to start a little bit with Microsoft's journey. Um, we, uh, and we want to talk about our developer division a little bit. When you think about um, developer process in uh, Microsoft, our developer division who creates our Visual Studio tools, uh, they're the ones that are usually out front in terms of that process. And then the rest of the company starts to adopt it. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about some history here around Visual Studio and how they made their transformation. Uh, Visual Studio actually goes back to the first version was released in 1997. And so it's, uh, it's been an off-the-shelf type of, uh, of uh, product for quite a long time. And it actually, uh, at that time, was having release cycles about every two or three years, which was pretty typical of Microsoft. Every two or three years, we'd have a big, massive release. And it was funny inside the company watching uh, them do these release cycles because um, what they would basically do is they'd have a whole bunch of coding and they have you know, hundreds of branches of, of Visual Studio, everybody in their branches as teams doing a whole bunch of coding. And then they would have this big kind of merge of these hundred branches. I think the guy from Yahoo was talking about yeah, this as well, right? About. Like these yeah. massive merges. Yeah, disaster. And one day, they'd have this one day and they would go and they'd party. And why were they partying? You might think it's because they shipped a product, right? No, they were partying because they were code complete. <laughs> and you know what code complete meant? It meant no more features being developed anymore for this product. And so now, for the next year to year and a half, they would start to just fix bugs. And I remember I'd go to these release meetings, because I used to work at, at Corp during this time. You go to these release meetings, and you see this just graph of just bugs trying to get all the way down to zero. And it was just so frustrating, because as you're looking and customers are starting to give you feedback and saying, we need this feature, or we need this thing, or this thing's not working right, you realize we can't do anything about it. All we can do is fix bugs right now. And it's gonna be another year, another two years before a customer gets this really uh, important um, feature. And so that all changed around uh, 2008 for the developer division when some of the groups actually went rogue almost. It's a very bottoms up transformation that happened where a, a couple of groups went rogue and they said, we need to be more agile. And uh, and actually, enough of those groups uh, got agile where 2010, when we released that product, it actually started to win some industry rewards, which was surprising to a lot of us because the last few versions were just uh, really so off the mark and low quality. And so 2010 is really when this transformation uh, began. But the other thing that started in 2010 uh, is that we started to work on this um, online service. Um, and so we started to think, we've got to take our team foundation services and move them over to uh, software as a service. And that started another kind of journey, which we kind of had uh, moved Agile into the organization and everyone was thinking more about customer value in, the, in terms of features. Um, but we were still kind of shipping that as an off-the-shelf product. And so uh, when we started thinking about um, moving to Visual Studio Team Service, we also started to think about the operations side and the developer side. And it was a long, it was a long journey as well. Um, in 2013, we shipped the first version of this. It was actually called Visual Studio Online. Uh, last week, we just renamed it because our marketing department decided to rename it to Visual Studio Team Service. Um, but the first day we released it, we learned a big lesson at Microsoft again. And uh, we said, Here's Visual Studio Online, it's ready for you. And then we did a six hour outage immediately, <laughs> right away. And, uh, and so this actually is a graph over the uh, first uh, really week of Visual Studio Online being online, of the, of the number of outages that we had, the lengths of them, and the just amount of learning that Microsoft realized we have to get this de developer and operations, this DevOps things uh, down. And, uh, and actually, they made a lot of progress, and, and, uh, and now, um, really, they're up to 99.9% you know, .9 uptime, their SLA that they want. They have a goal of just being 100% uptime uh, all the time internally. But uh, over that time, they've, uh, they've learned a lot, and uh, they've narrowed that down into kind of the seven habits of DevOps, or the seven habits of, of really being a SaaS provider. Um, and these are those seven habits. I start with like the team one. I think the, the thing that they 
uh, worked on the most was just getting the organization into a, a place where they had the right size teams with the right capabilities. And so they moved the teams to uh, eight to 12 members. Um, they used three week sprints. Uh, and they make sure that there's multiple disciplines across uh, uh, the team. Um, uh, I don't know if you know how closely you watch uh, Microsoft, but we had this big news thing last year where um, we've always had development and we've always had test. And last year, um, we said we're going to merge those two paths at Microsoft. And it was a, it's a big change for a company that's got tens of thousands of engineers to say we're going to eliminate a role and merge that into engineering. But that's what we needed to do in terms of team autonomy. And another area um, they had to work on, of course, was uh, the flow of customer value. They had started to do that in the Agile process, um, but with that flow of customer value, they still had to, these big releases that they were, gonna, they were gonna have. Of course, with DevOps, we have shorter releases that cost less time, and so that, cu that flow of customer value um, they could actually shorten and get out there uh, much quicker. They could experiment a lot more and find that customer value. Which uh, uh, brings you to the next one, evidence uh, gathered in production. Um, one of the things that they really put a big priority on is their uh, telemetry code in, in uh, the software. And that's one of the things that they feel is one, some of the most important code because that actually tells them about the usage of the software. Not only just uptime or not only just uh, the health statistics of the, the service, but they also even have telemetry around customer sentiment. Uh, they're, they're constantly looking at um, even the kind of outlier cases to see what are things that they could do to improve um, that customer value. And that, that kind of feeds right into the way they do backlog now as well, uh, which was a big change uh, for them. We've always traditionally had big product managers who were expected to be kind of omniscient around knowing exactly what the customers were going to need, not just today, but two years or three years from now when the product shift. That, that all had to change. And so they moved the way they, um, they transitioned the way they did backlog uh, into um, this, this shorter hypothesis um, based um, uh, uh, method, which basically what they do is they come up with a hypothesis. They say, okay, now we need to do an experiment and we need to make sure we can measure that experiment to know the before and after. And I think you're gonna talk about that in a little bit to show some of the outputs of that. Um, and so, uh, of course, in order to be able to have those shorter sprints and be able to do experimentation, uh, you wanna watch your technical debt uh, quite a bit. And so um, they make sure that they watch technical debt uh, uh, closely. Uh, they see all that debt as risk um, in not only kind of uh, live site uh, incidents where it might bring the site down, but they also see it as risk and not being able to continuously uh, uh, provide that customer value. And so they focus on keeping technical debt down. Uh, of course, a production-first mindset is mandatory with uh, SaaS. Um, the service has got to stay up. Um, that was a transition for them a little bit in that um, when they first released, that first release they had with all the downtime, um, they had only really thought about having one scale unit out there. Um, and now uh, they've grown that to being able to deploy now to five or six scale units around the world. Um, in fact, now they've deployed one that is used uh, internally at Microsoft for um, even the Windows development team um, that has to stay up. And so, but they deploy it there first, and then they say, well, if it's uh, stable in there for a few hours, then we'll go ahead and start uh, deploying it out to the rest of the world. But they want to keep that um, production up as much as possible. And then the last one is just around man managing infrastructure as a flexible resource. Um, how many people like peanut butter and jelly? Right? Everybody likes peanut butter and jelly, and they go together. And I always say that, uh, DevOps and cloud is like peanut butter and jelly. You can certainly separate them if you want, but they're always best eaten together. And, uh, and that's where we're at with uh, DevOps as well. Is, um, the, uh, we have everything up in the cloud um, so that we can scale and keep production up um, along with our users' usage. Um, we can uh, have it distributed around the globe and, and have that um, production-first mindset. And the cloud is essential in that. And so those are seven habits of DevOps at Microsoft, and I think you're going to talk about a few other companies now that you've learned from. Yeah. So. Cool. Do you want me to advance it yeah. for you? Yeah. Oh, if you want to look at the seven habits, you can see, the, see it in the website of us. So you can search in the DevOps Microsoft, please. Yeah. 
right? So, and uh, I'm going to talk about uh, yeah, Microsoft and other companies DevOps journey, typical patterns, some patterns. This is um, the pattern of the Microsoft DevOps journey pattern. And first of all, we have a four teams separated. We have also a totally silo. <laughs> this is totally separated, and they only care about their own KPI or something, and very bad. So we decide to, after moving on to the Agile, and we change something, the teamwork, like this. And Dev and QA and merged into the engineering team, and this is the first step of us. And but still remains the ops and the program manager silo. So how to break it? Just simple. Just merge it into the future team, right? So we, we form uh, one team and uh, mix up uh, people and one team and try to start collaborate. They we provide we give them a uh, uh, no, how to say that and uh, power to the power to the team. So we we do any more about uh, for example the command and command and control manner stuff. Uh, they they are self organizing team. So they are now they collaborate with the customer and have a bit power to think about themselves. So they can now they run from the customer very quickly and represent and get the feedback from the customer and implement into the product. And we run from the customer right now. And this is a one example of the Microsoft DevOps journey. And another thing is like this. And uh, this is a target, the company and the company of the retail company in the US. And they are huge because the second biggest company, retail company in the US. So, but he, they successfully transit into DevOps from the waterfall manner into the DevOps. I was surprised because now they achieved 80 deploys per week, even if in a big, very big company. And, uh, but, they only have 10 incidents per month. It's so surprising, right? They're a very big company. They have a lot of the bureaucracy and red tapes or something like that. But they successfully, successfully do it. And but at first of all, they don't have any support. They do it by themselves at first. And so they define such as the phase of the DevOps maturity. The first First and the first first step could be a change agent, uh, which means uh, uh, he is a guy and uh, who started uh, some this DevOps journey. And uh, first of all, he tried to find out the someone who support DevOps in your com company in in his company, and uh, uh, who is a very uh, unicorn. Uh, he is uh, very enthusiast, enthusiast over the DevOps or something like that, and start with that finding someone um, to who have a passion to the DevOps. Then they move into the grassroots movement. They invite a lot of the very cool guy from the other side of the company and having a very huge and, uh, event in internally. And like the Lactin, not, not Lactin, Lactin conference is <laughs> not internal, but uh, they had an internal conference and uh, doing uh, se several times. And uh, so gradually they uh, gain, uh, gain the supporter. And then the, they try to access the uh, upper management, and the, which means the top down. The finally, they scale. Now, and what I'm impressed, I was impressed was and, uh, the scale, and they have a dojo. Do you know, who knows the dojo? <laughs> Only few. <laughs> dojo is, uh, yeah. And, uh, if you want to scale in a very big company, you need to support a lot of people. And he, he and organized a dojo. And the dojo, if you, and if you, you, ha, you are in a project, and if you want to learn about the DevOps, you can go to the dojo anytime, maybe once, once per week, and you can learn every time about the DevOps, for example, the infrastructure as code, and the continuous delivery, and something like that stuff. So, now they successfully and uh, transit into the DevOps, but he said he's on the, just on the journey. And other example is Rakuten, you guys, right? <laughs> and uh, this is a very clever guy, and uh, Yasunobu Kawaguchi. 
The, this is his idea, not me, <laughs> not me, right? And he said, now is a time, very impressive time for us, among us. Because, uh, yeah, now microservices changing, try to change the world right now. Why? Because, uh, uh, you know, the, for example, the DevOps techniques and the agile techniques looks like for only for the startups. Oh, okay, the startups could do that. But uh, how about our company? We are very big enterprise company. So for this reason, then for a long time, the enterprise company failed and beat it by the very small startups. They are very quick and innovative and uh, yeah, deploy uh, 10 deploys per day or something. Yeah, but it, is, it was very difficult for the big company. But these days, a the lot of things have been changed because of the microservices. The micro, and we used to create a big software only the monolithic approach, but now we can divide into the small services and connect it, and uh, then we can create a very big services right now. And if you use this style, you can divide a team only a small amount of people. So only, for, for example, the three, three people for one microservices or something like this. In this case, you can do the same thing as a startup, like a DevOps and uh, you know, the continuous delivery or something like that, very easily. Communication is much easier, and which means uh, even if the big company can do the same thing as a startup right now, this is a huge innovation right now. So a lot of people is very interested in the microservices because of this reason. This is his idea. I, I totally agree with him. And another impressive story about the transition into the DevOps is uh, Yahoo Japan. Not Yahoo, <laughs> Yahoo Japan. I interviewed them, and they said, they said very impressive things for me. And uh, he <laughs> how to destroy the devs and, uh, devs and ops silo? And their answer is like this. They, at first of all, they pick up the unicorns from the dev, actually the leader of the devs, you know, very clever and very, and uh, yeah, the unicorn, unicorns guy. And they move the unicorn into the ops and make it ops, you know, like this. <laughs> oh, I was surprised. Oh, they have uh, you know, maybe 10 times 10 times productivity than usual developer. Uh, you have a college or something. But they finally successfully and transit into the such like a, a ops, uh, ops. Ops is a, at first of all not, uh, not open minded and never create a automation or something. But after uh, moving this uh, organization, they yeah, cultivate a culture of the automation of the yeah, ops team and start creating the, and the infrastructure as code and try to automate everything or something. Yeah, it was a very impressive idea for me. And so, the, what is the future for the DevOps? The, I went to the DevOps Enterprise Conference last month and, and uh, went to the, you, look at this, DockerCon. <laughs> DockerCon. Uh, so, Maybe the next step could be a security and a container and microservices, as I mentioned. Hey, look at this. <laughs> this is a very funny, right? And uh, what the security person sees the DevOps, you know? How, how security person sees the DevOps? Yeah, DevOps is very great and actually uh, unicorn. But they poops, then the rainbow poops, and <laughs> but the security person need to clean up. Oops. <laughs> this is so a lot of people forget about the security. Only the deploy, deploy, deploy or something. Yeah, it is very important, but also the security matters. This is one movement on the, the in the future. And another thing is that DockerCon is uh, about of course, which means container. Yeah, it was a very huge and very passionate and uh, yeah, exciting movement. And uh, DockerCon right now, and uh, Docker move on to the end-to-end -end solution, not only the container, just uh, meaning a deployment and operating it or something like that. They um, announced a lot of the product line in this DockerCon in 2015. 
And the now, the Dokka is a lot of people, it is not for the production, just a testing or something, but not. Actually, the now Dokka in production, yeah, for example, the this case, and the Oxford University Press start to, uh, started using the Dokka in production, and also the 20, 20th Century Fox also the using the Dokka for production. Very impressive, right? And also, this is also case study of the microservices. So now, world is changing. <coughs> yeah, this is the journey of the DevOps part. And uh, next, the automation part. <coughs> yeah. Welcome to the Kotaro Ogino about to continuous system testing. Please welcome Mr. Kotaro. Hello. The, uh, yeah, first of all, I'd like to, okay. Uh, where is the okay. object? Oh, sorry. Okay, during this time, you can enjoy my dancing and singing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Woo! <laughs> yeah. Oh, you are, I, I love you guys because you are very uh, powerful and passionate, right? And uh, yeah, I need to do something for them, right? Oh, please come. Please come. Oh, you, you, you do not do, do nothing, right? So you can, you can do anything. <laughs> oh, finished? Okay. Yeah, I, I'm ready now. <laughs> yeah, hello, everybody. I'm Kota Logina from Lakten. And OK, so I'd like to you know, introduce our DevOps effort in Lakten. Then, yeah, this is agenda. So DevOps is consists of people, process, product. So first, I'd like to talk about people. The, okay, so I am from Group Core Service, which provides Group Core Service, uh, Group Core Service like ID, points, checkout, payments. And okay, now Lactane is expanding our business in globally. So we have many, many, you know, group companies, group families in the, you know, US, EU, blah, 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 blah. So we got many, you know, dec <laughs> business requirements from those, you know, gl global companies. And okay, sometimes we just need to change one configuration in the system. But in that case, we'd like to release, you know, that new configuration change or feature immediately, or you know, as soon as possible. But sometimes we need to, you know, take our time. So, or you know, this is our, you know, business requirements to business value, value streams. And in this value streams, we have several teams, dev, ops, test automation team. Now, we are not perfect DevOps team now, but we are now constructing you know, team and platform now. The next slide is okay. Ah, yes, so one month ago, we had a you know, newcomer training. And now, okay, so now Lactane is now getting global, and we have many, many, you know, global engineers. And, you know, there is cultural difference. Okay, so now newcomers or new graduates or cloud, cloud native generation, they are very familiar with cloud. And this time I gave the, you know, requirement to construct a performance automation platform based on Jenkins, Gartling, OpenStack Chef. And yeah, Kawaguchi san or Yenaga san, those, you know, agile coach supports to, you know, uh, they are learning DevOps cultures and agile cultures. And they so it is surprising. They just, you know, construct automation platform in two weeks. That is very surprising. But, you know, generation is very, very now changing. Product side. So this is our deployment pipeline through, you know, uh, source code, source code change, source code changes here, source code change to, you know, release. We have several stages, commit stage, acceptance stage, stable stage, capacity stage. And we have, you know, some definition of done works, acceptance criteria for each stage. Source code, source code quality is verified in commit stage. And acceptance stage, we are verifying the, you know, business system behavior. Also, capacity stage, we are doing performance test, also operability test. And based on those, you know, JUnit, Selenium, Sonar Cube, Cucumber, Jacko, Cosmos, Labs, Xamarin, Gatling, those tools. 
I have some demos. Well, I, I would like to share the, you know, some cool tools. Okay. Demos. Demos. Yeah, this is Jenkins over Jenkins. So we are currently, you know, automating the uh, all the you know activities in the deployment pipe on the de deployment pipeline on Jenkins. And this is over the uh, Jenkins uh, page. And here, a bit small. Okay. All the, uh, this is. Cucumber source code. We are writing the, you know, all the business values in uh, Cucumber. That means okay, all the test scenario are automated and stored in Git. So one important you know, philosophy to automate the test case is we need to you know, store test, test cases and test scenario in source code uh, SCM. And yes, so in Cucumber, we can you know, write the test scenario in BDD format, behavior driven testing format. Uh, so given when, then. So the you know, advantage of BDD format is test scenario can be written in um, non engineer can, non engineer people, non technical people can read or understand the test scenario. That is important things. And okay, so we just not automate the functional test. We also automate the operability test. Operability is one of the important point of test automation in DevOps. Cool. Because not just you know functionality or behavior for end users are enough. Because in DevOps, ops is also the you know uh, people who get the value from the test automation. So all the you know, availability or consistency or uh, reliability, those kind of operability qualities are tested and verified in the test automation. Um, okay, so this is functional testing the API, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so I'd like to share source labs. We are using source labs for allowing the you know, multi browser testing. So, in this uh, view, okay, so, you know, different versions of Chrome are tested Chrome 34 or Chrome 35, Firefox 29, Firefox 29 on Windows 7. Oh, impressive. Then, Cucumber. This is. Uh, this is a report page of Cucumber. So, okay, so all the you know test report test results are visualized by Cucumber. And I would like to show the okay. This is our Jenkins plugin. We implemented our own Jenkins plugin for source labs because our you know that servers or Jenkins and the system under test are located in our on-premise servers. And we need some you know, special tooling for connecting those Jenkins and source labs. So we implemented this solution as a Jenkins, Jenkins plugin. And okay, one of the advantage of using source labs is okay, it allows multiple browser testing. And also, it can you know, record all the screencasts. So you can see the test scenario and the test result after exec executing those test scenario. Uh, oh. <laughs> so in this test case, I think yeah, we are checking the coupon. Use, end user can get the coupon, and it is shown in the uh, personal page. Okay, we are also automating performance testing, and performance testing, uh, the requirement is a bit different from functional testing, because functional testing. In the most of the case, functional testing, uh, only one or two, you know, Jenkins slaves are enough. But for fa performance test, we need to make a scalable performance testing platform. So we decided to use our private cloud to make a scalable performance test platform based on OpenStack. So here we can, you know, test engineer can easily, oh, 10 minutes left. Okay, all okay. the, you know, <laughs> test engineer can provision testing, test, test client gathering uh, as, as much as they want. Mm. 
So previously, we need to you know, to one week or two weeks to set up all the test environment, but we can easily just create the test environment by one click. Oh, one, one click, cool. One click. Then this is operability test. I skip this one and oh, test rails. Ah, especially I I'd like to show over you know Kibana. This Kibana show collect all the metrics related to CI testing activities during uh, inside of the deployment pipeline pipeline. And we show the uh, so this one. Okay, so this is sta stableness of smoke test is shown. So. Blue one is failing and red, green one is succeeding. So we are keep monitoring the stableness of smoke test. And code coverage, code coverage, a number of you know warning in static code analysis and deployment frequency. So okay, so I think in the next section, Ushio san talk us about continuous improvement based on those you know monitoring and uh, Reporting. So I'd like to uh, take the mic over to Ushio san. Okay. <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, I, I skipped that slide actually. <laughs> oh. I, I had I had it, but uh, we have only uh, 45 time, right? Yeah. yeah. We need to speak in some other place more much longer time, right? Cool. Cool. So. In this time, the quarter will talk about a very impressive strategy about the continuous testing. So I'd like to introduce um, the automation in uh, the VSO team. The VSO, uh, sorry, that it's changed the name right now. And uh, but uh, our third services. And uh, so, and uh, one was a very, and uh, oh, oops, sorry. Mm -hmm. And da -da 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 -da. So, and one of the characteristic of our cloud services, especially that this is Visual Studio Online, is uh, this is not not a uh, native cloud platform. We used to create it for the only on premises. That is why we and uh, another characteristic could be uh, only not only the on premise. We need to release both on premise version and cloud version. It is very difficult, right? So we decide to the using the same code base to the both platform. This is the one strategy. Yeah, very. So and uh, we, as a Visual Studio Online, this is all the name. Sorry, but uh, we release every three weeks, one once per three weeks, very quick. Of course, we can deploy and uh, ten deploys per day internally, but actually we have us uh, yeah only three weeks. Power one deploy because uh, users must <laughs> yeah, confuse right. So, but uh, for the the on-premise product, we release uh, three months once per three months. So, but we use the same code base for this because uh, this, this is the differences between the customer perspectives. And about the automated deployment and uh, yeah, so we can deploy anytime actually. So. And we can use we use uh, a TFS release management, which means uh, our release management mechanism. And uh, you can use if you use uh, such like our product, right? And uh, which means we do dog fooding, <laughs> dog fooding, right? This is very important point. And uh, so and we are we are using doing the canary testing as well. And uh, so and we also use a future flag, future future flag. How many people knows about the future plug? Oh, very few. And uh, yeah, this is very impressive yeah, strategy for the uh, deploy something. And uh, you just the turn off the future. And uh, you can turn on the future. And then it will reveal to the customer. And you can deploy every time, but never, never open to the public. But if you, if you want to turn on the future, then it is opened quickly, which means that we can easily oh oh five minutes <laughs> we can easily to e easily to and uh, turn on and turn off very quickly. And uh, if something problem, you can easily to turn off. <laughs> this is uh, one of the strategy of the deployment. 
And so this is uh, this is not important. Our risk management system and future flag, and I, I, I explained. And also we do the canary testing, and the canary testing means uh, deployment to the actual environment, uh, the part of the people. And so we have a uh, several, yeah, we we have a uh, lot of the uh, and the region in all over the world. So at first of all, we deploy only this section and. Uh, after that rollout, if we found uh, this section uh, problem in this section, and of course we stop <laughs> releasing, it, just quickly fix it and then spread it, something like this stuff. And the uh, next uh, slide is uh, from my learning from the DevOps interview, and I I interviewed a lot of the people and the company, and I about a uh, continuous de deployment strategy, I noticed a uh, very simple one thing. And uh, one company, uh, this which means uh, speed and quality. And some company try to focus on the speed. And some company is focused on the quality. The Kotaro's approach is a co quality focus on approach. And for example, the, the, this is a just quick rollback approach is, uh, for example, the uh, Cookpad. Uh, Cookpad people say like this. Uh, he is very care about the system testing and operating, operating testing, right? But uh, Rakuten guys say like this. Oh, who cares? Who cares about the system testing? No, we only do the, yeah, you know, unit testing and functional testing. That's all. That's enough. Who cares about the system testing? Why? But they can easily to roll back for, for the former state. This is their strategy. What, what, which, what is the difference between two? This is the domain, the business. The Rakuten treat money, right? So, you know, so that is why they try to focus on the quality, of course, as a speed, uh, including speed. But uh, as a cook part, and don't care about uh, so much because uh, some kind of the layout wrongness mm, doesn't matter. Just roll back quickly. The GitHub is the same strategy. So, and uh, this is uh, just to give up the um, huge quality, but uh, they can deliver it very quickly. And uh, GitHub says uh, 100 per day or something, 100 deploys per day or something. <laughs> this is one strategy. And another strategy is a uh, quality focus like him. But I've never heard only him try to do this in my case study. So you are very impressive, and so that is why the Microsoft Corporation very interesting in you, <laughs> actually. <laughs> so it, I, I think it is very impressive. The world case study. Oh. oh. Yes, yes, Chaos Monkey and Gorilla or something, right? Yeah, they just do, uh, yeah, and uh, in a production, they try to destroy their instance, right? <laughs> because they, they must can roll back <laughs> if something happened. And uh, yeah, yeah you, you can check it out, such as, uh, that, that is called, I forgot the English name, but uh, Chaos Monkey and the Gorilla is called uh, fa Failure Injection or something. I forgot the name, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, but, but you can check it out. And uh, how many times left, please? <laughs> no, eh? No minutes? Okay. T eh? Ten minutes? Two minutes, okay. So, let me la lap up. So, sorry, I, I'd like to speak, uh, speak about such like things, but we cannot speak. No time. Sorry. So, please ex expect next time or next year. Of course, of course, why not? And you can learn about DevOps. And uh, you know, the DevOps is not about the technology. Of course, technology is very important, but the people and the process comes first. So we and create a subject, uh, uh, organize uh, some practices, and uh, you can learn very quickly and easily the, what is a DevOps and what, how to learn about it. So you can check it out this URL, if you like. And if you want to more, learn about the DevOps more deeply, you can uh, participate in this event. This is meant for free. Yeah, yeah both people can come, and uh, this is two, two days hackathon with uh, 
the an evangelist of us, so you can learn a lot of the DevOps practice and actually do it by yourself, and we can help how to implement it. So we can learn very quickly a whole range of the DevOps with the Dev and Ops person. We call the both both people and the Devs and Ops, and the mix up making a team in a mix up, Devs and Ops. Now you can experience the actual DevOps in now two days. And I recommend this. Please come. Of course, of course, free, and you can. You eat belly, yummy, and the lunchbox. You know? Yeah, you know, we are Microsoft. We are, you have money. <laughs> right? Yeah. Greedy. <laughs> so, so, and the end of the, yeah, this presentation, I'd like to give you two presents for you. This is a DevOps t shirt But if you participate in this event, you can get it. But Special. I, 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 today, I, I give you these two very important DevOps teachers. If you have a question for us, please give, me a, give us a question. Hey. Uh, I want to ask something. I'm interested particularly in Microsoft Azure. Is there some part of Azure that is not automated currently at Microsoft? Automated? Uh, yeah. Could you repeat it again? Yeah, again, in please? Azure, is there something that currently it's not automated in Azure and that requires like a manual, manual operations? Because uh, we hear that cloud is so uh, scripted and automated, but is, is there some part of Azure that requires like a manual operation or everything is completely automated? Oh, well. <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like we're going to say it's all automated, then you're going to go, wait, I found one. No, 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 it just, uh, it's interesting. The, uh, no, everything's automated in Azure. I mean, it has to be, like, it, the infrastructure for us, I mean, we've, I think right now we have more data centers than Google and Amazon uh, combined. And so you, we have to have everything automated. Um, that's at our infrastructure level, but I assume you mean at the customer level. Mm -hmm. One thing that we do is we have this thing called uh, Resource Manager, yes. um, as well as a set of... Um, uh, command line utilities that are absolute requirements. So when you're thinking about a three week feature team, um, that is like, it's not done until you have uh, it in resource manager or in the command line uh, utilities, so. Thank you. Okay. Oh, this, uh, which one? Well, okay. You. Oh, you are very resemble, resemble for our CEO, like a, well, uh, so uh, just the discussion that everything is automated. So, sorry, uh, just I to know that uh, how the system is detecting the rollback situation and how the rollback is going to be automated. I mean, in that sense, in that scenario, if everything is automated, then how the system is uh, detecting the rollback situation and how it's uh, uh, moving back to the rollback. Okay. Yeah. For the Microsoft or, or Rakuten, both? <laughs> Especially for Microsoft, because I'm actually an employee, that's why. <laughs> okay, okay. So we have a several, several major for this. And, uh, you know, one is the future flag. The future flag, right? So if we have a problem about something, just put off the future flag. This is the one rollback. Okay, I see. Yeah? And another thing could be, uh, yeah, we only allow the only roll forward, especially the databases. And because we just test only the internally, only this one uh, system unit. And if you find out this, and if you, and we actually do the test during the this and doing the canary test in the production. So, so in this case, we don't need to actually roll back, right? So because we already test by in the part of the world. I see, yeah. That's a Visual Studio, right? Like that's what they're doing for Visual Studio. From an Azure perspective, there's actually, it's almost, we don't have enough time to really go through all of them, but there's actually a lot of different ways to structure rollback based on what your need is. And so we have um, the ability to flip back and forth between a production and test deployment. We do a, 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 a Git-based deployment as well, which is really easy to roll back because you can just uh, grab back to the previous uh, uh, snapshot basically um, but each of the services we have IaaS services to 
uh, PaaS services to other services, and each one has kind of a, a different set of offerings because they have different uh, domains to them. Um, and so if there's a particular one you need, you can certainly contact us and we'll help you. Sure, figure thank it you out. so much. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So time is over. If you want to ask something about f something about something, uh, please ask us after the session. So, and thank you so much indeed. Bye for now.